Well, good morning. It's so good to see so many here this morning. I hear a lot of children talking. All the families are back from vacation. Hmm, I wonder what happens tomorrow, kids. <laughs> it is so glad to see all the families back. We are family here. If you've been visiting a long time, we'd like to ask you to join our family. It's a great place to be. Please stand as we all read the scripture. It's going to appear on the screen. Read with me, please. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father.
please turn to those around you and welcome them to worship. Welcome indeed. <laughs> it is so good to see you. I'm glad you're here. God does do great things. And one of the great things is that in the 930 service, we had our 11th new church member for the month of August. Just in case you haven't noticed, that doesn't usually happen. <laughs> but 11 people have joined the church this month in August, and the month's not over yet. So praise God. Great things. And another great thing is that Eric Snyderhan is coming in view of a call next Sunday as our student pastor, and he will be here in both worship services, also activities on Saturday that people know about, and there is a, an open house on Saturday morning. So look on the website so you can meet him then. You can see him on Sunday. And I appreciate the work of the student pastor search team that has worked for a year to uh, bring, bring Eric here. So we're looking forward to that. August is usually kind of a sleepy month around D.C., but this August is not shaping up that way. Uh, that next Sunday is Promotion Sunday, and of course Eric will be here. And then on August 31st, we start all of our Wednesday night meals and programming back. So that's all starting because school starts tomorrow. Aren't we excited? <laughs> so thank you for being here. So good to see you. And also thank you for your support of the ministries of this church. The offering plates are at the doors, plus the offering plate in your phone and computer. So thank you for your support. We appreciate that. And if you're here for the first time, and we had a number of visitors at 930, a guest, and so if you're here for the first time today, or you want to know more about the church, you can cue the QR code, <laughs> click on the QR code there in front of you, and you can also go to the Welcome Center out of the, after the service, and somebody will be there to help you. Brian Jones is preaching today. We're always glad to have Brian here. So let's pray today from Psalm 71. Psalm 71, verse 1. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. All of us have things that we are or could be ashamed of. But because of the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God poured out on the cross, in the life, and in the resurrection, and in the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, we don't need to be ashamed. He is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help and resource for our lives and relationships right now where you are. Open your mind and your heart to Jesus Christ. Speak to him about those things that, that trouble you. And know in him that sense of refuge, protection, strength, hope, resilience, and grace. Verse 5. For you have been my hope, sovereign Lord, my confidence since my youth. Maybe there are times when you don't feel so confident. Maybe some of those times are right now. Open yourself right now to the hope and the sovereignty of God and let his confidence, not in you, 
and not in us, but in him, flood you and restore you. Verse 15, my mouth will tell of your righteous deeds, of your saving acts all day long. As you encounter God through Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit, today and every day, be sure to let that encounter transform your attitude and behavior and your words. Surrender right now yourself to God to hear his voice, to embrace his righteous deeds, and to let that transform who you are, what you do, how you do it, where your attitudes are, and the words that you speak. O oh Lord, our Lord, how wonderful is your name, how powerful is your Son. We come together in this place to worship you, but also to receive you and to be transformed by you and to encounter you in ways that make a difference in our lives and therefore in our families, in this church, and in the world. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. You know, you folks have been so gracious over the last few months. I can almost feel <laughs> when I make an occasional stumble, I can almost feel some, somewhere around the front here, someone saying, help him, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Please stand as we all sing together, shout to the Lord.
Sing that chorus one more time. Shout to the Lord on the earth, let us see. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down at the seas, will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy. seated.
Well, good morning, class. My name is Mr. Jones, and I'm going to be your instructor this morning. If you've got your Bibles, and we'll turn to the book of 2 Timothy, verses two, uh, chapter 2, verses 14 through 23, that's going to be our textbook reading today. If you've got your phone and want to click on that QR code, there's a syllabus that you can kind of follow along, take some notes uh, as we venture through this together. This morning, for some of us, you're going to be hearing things that you already know, but I am doing what Paul has asked us to do, and that is to remind us of these things. So beginning in verse 14, keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place, and, the, and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. God bless the reading of his word. Will you pray with me? God, this morning, we come to you to be reminded. For some of us, we know these things, we've heard these things, we've been around these things, but other things have clouded our focus on what is truly important. So God, today, clear our minds and our hearts of the anticipations of next week and the distractions of last week, and let us just stay focused on you, to hear your word, to hear your voice. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Big day tomorrow, big day tomorrow in Fairfax County, Arlington, Alexandria, Fairfax City, across the region, students are going to be getting up. Packing lunches, packing backpacks, putting them on, getting on the yellow bus, and moms are going to be waving, moms might be chasing the bus, or pouring mimosas. One of those things is going to be happening tomorrow morning about 8 o'clock. Those three words, back to school. Back to school, it's that time of year. The three words that causes some students to cringe because it means the end of summer, it means homework, it means schedules, it means tests, it means assignments. I was kind of in that camp growing up. But for other students, they celebrate. And that was kind of the camp my wife Tony was in. She loved back to school because it meant seeing friends that she hadn't seen all summer. It meant a clean start, a, a new slate. It meant new school clothes. And most importantly, it meant organizing all of her assignments in a trapper keeper, which arguably to Tony is the best organizational material that has ever been developed, a trapper keeper. Well, you know, that first day of class, after the teacher gets up or the instructor or professor in a college and introduces themselves, typically they'll pass out a syllabus. And if you're in my age or a little bit older, you would get that syllabus, and it was typically with some purple ink, and the syllabus was a little damp and a little warm because it had just been run off on a mimeograph machine. And if you were like me, you took that syllabus and you did this. 
And I don't know if it was the excitement of the first day or kind of the high I was getting from the toxicity of the ink, but I always enjoyed that first day of school. Can I propose to you in keeping with that theme that we are in a class, and that class is entitled Eternal Life. And that class, like all classes, has a duration. Uh, Instead of a year or 16 weeks, like in college semester, this class lasts forever. And just as I was reminded this past week when I stroked that first check to Christopher Newport for Brianna's first semester of college, every class comes with a cost. And the cost of eternal life is everything you have. When you would get that syllabus, you knew that that was kind of the contract between you and the professor. It would have the title of the class. It would typically always have the goals of the class, what you were hoping to achieve and perform. And then it would move on to the guidelines of the class. What were some of the responsibilities to do well in that class? And it always kind of finished with the grade. What were the grades and how were they determined? Well, today, as we look at this passage that Paul wrote to his young protege, Timothy, he kind of lays out for us that in this class, eternal life, here are some of the goals, the guidelines, and what we will get as a grade. And the first thing that Paul starts off with is the goal of the class in verse 15 is to be approved by God. He says it this way, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Now, when I read that statement, it causes me to wonder, what would cause a worker or a student to feel ashamed? Well, maybe they didn't do the work or they did it in a sloppy manner. I mean, I might be telling on myself, but have you ever not done an assignment or a task? When you think back to your school years, were there some tests that you kind of blew off, some assignments you just didn't do wholeheartedly. I mean, am I the only one that can remember sitting down and not really have studied very well and really pulling on, dear God, I know I haven't studied for trigonometry, but if you can reveal it to me the way you revealed the Ten Commandments to Moses, that would be great. And there may have been one time in eighth grade when I didn't do an assignment, and I may have prayed these words, God, today before third period would be a great day for the rapture to happen. That would just help me so much. Well, the truth is we have all had an assignment, had a task that we didn't do or we just kind of did half-heartedly. We didn't really put our all in it, and and we were kind of ashamed about that. We, We knew and hoped nobody would find out about it. And I would venture to guess some of you right now in your inboxes, your emails, you've got one or two kind of assignments that are there that you just haven't addressed. You're kind of just hoping they'll just take care of themselves and no one will find out that you didn't do it. I want to tell you that in this class, Eternal Life, God has given you and I some assignments. He has put them on your syllabus to do. And we need to step up and do them. One of the primary ones that he has given us is what Paul says there is to study the word, to read the textbook. And so my question for you this morning is how are you doing in studying the textbook? Do you stand ashamed or do you stand approved? Lifeway Research did a survey a few years ago to see what were the key indicators of whether a person was really growing as a disciple of Jesus. And they looked at everything, and the number one indicator if a person was beginning to look more and act more like Jesus was simply this, did they read their Bible? It wasn't how often they came to church, it wasn't whether they were in the choir, how many committees they served on, whether they went on a mission trip, but simply, did they read the Bible? Not only are we to be approved by God, but the second goal is to be used by God. Paul says it this way, in a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, 
made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Paul uses this section of scripture to say that we need to be growing in our holiness and in our purity of heart so that we can be given even more special assignments that will come with even bigger special blessings. Again, do you remember back in school that sometimes the good kids, the well-behaved kids, they would get some special assignments. Growing up in elementary school before computers and things like that, uh, I remember very clearly that teachers would take attendance on an attendance card, each kid, whether they were there or not. And then they'd put it in this manila folder. And then they would scan the classroom for a good student, a well-behaved student, that they could trust to take this attendance card down to the school office. And if you got picked for that, you knew that was a special deal. You loved it. You typically were buddied up with somebody, but you got to walk that attendance card down through the halls. And you felt like king of the school because nobody else was in the hallways. You could look in at classes and wave, and friends were like, oh, man, he's out of class, just walking around. But it was great. They knew they couldn't give the bad behavior kid that job because the kid would never come back to class. We love getting special assignments. I remember when Brianna was in like kindergarten, one day because she was so well behaved, she was made line leader. Now, if you're not familiar with line leader, this is a big deal. This is when you walk the front of the line the whole day. And I remember Brianna came home. She was excited about it. She was telling me everything that happened. But she also said, Dad, as I was leading the line, this one little boy kept, he kept croaching up on me. He kept wanting to pass me. And so finally I just stopped and turned around and said, get back. I am line leader. I knew we were going to have some control issues with that kid at that point. Well, this scripture tells us that if we will grow in our faithfulness that God desires to use us for even more special assignments. Paul picks it up in another place, and this is one of my favorite verses in scripture because I believe this verse gives us purpose for our lives if we're believers. It says this in Ephesians 2.10, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That is an exciting verse. Because what that tells me is that this Christian life, it's more than just getting your ticket punched. It's more than just fire insurance. If once you become a believer in Jesus, if that was all that mattered, then why are we not just transported to heaven right then? It's because from the day you accept Christ until your last breath, your purpose, your desire should be to do good deeds, good works that point people back to God. We're not saved through that, but God has things he has put just for you to do. And if you don't do it, it may not get done. So are you this morning being used by God? Not only do you have the goals of the class, but secondly, you always had the guidelines of the class. And the first guideline we have in this class, eternal life, is one, you got to register. It says it this way in verse 19, nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with the name of this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Now, I don't know if you ever did this in school, but Some people, they won't take the class, they'll kind of audit the class. And when you audit a class, you show up like all the other students, but your commitment level is a whole lot less. I mean, you don't have to do the papers, you don't have to take the tests, but at the end of it, you don't get a grade. It doesn't really count. I mean, hopefully you learn some things, but you're not going to get a grade that goes towards a degree of any sort. Well, some people kind of treat Christianity that way. They kind of just want to audit it. They just want to come and sit in the pew, and they're just here because their spouse is here. And if that's you, then great, I'm glad you are. But eventually, you can be around it, but you got to register. And you register through a relationship with Jesus Christ. The second guideline of the class is that you have to have regular attendance. You remember this in every syllabus you ever got. There was always a section about attendance. When I was a professor over at the Leland Seminary, on every one of my syllabi, it said this, if you miss three classes, you fail. That was the the policy of the school. You know and I know that if you're going to be successful in a class, 
you have to show up. And in Hebrews, the writer says it this way, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. That is so important. Perhaps more than any other time in my life is that more important than this season of life we are in today. Because a lot of believers have kind of given up the habit of meeting together in person. Now hear me, if you're watching online and I am glad you are, that's awesome. But if that's because it's comfortable rather than a true concern, you need to be back in the room. We need you here. In fact, just this past week, I was meeting with some pastors around North Star, 170 churches. I was meeting with some pastors, and they were feeling kind of discouraged. And here's what they were saying. Some of their longtime pillars of the church, some of the people they relied on for encouragement and faithfulness, they have just not seen anymore. They've gotten into the habit of not coming. And it's understandable. For several years, we were kind of scattered and People got into that habit, but these pastors were saying, beyond the encouragement and beyond the relationships of being in the room, we believe this. We believe God speaks through the church. God speaks through people. What does that mean? Well, today we have a program, and maybe God is speaking to you through the songs or through the prayers or maybe through these words But if I'm completely honest, there's been times I've shown up here in other churches that I didn't feel a nudge of God in the program. But oh man, God spoke loudly to me in a conversation in a hallway, out in the parking lot, hearing how someone was going through something very similar to me. And when we are not here, we miss out on that. You see, we've got to be reminded that God has called us to make disciples, not just viewers. It reminds me of the the story Jay Wolf told when I was a teenager here, and I I still remember it to this day, about the importance of regular attendance. And Jay told it in the way only Jay can tell it, that he was getting his car worked on by a mechanic, and as Jay would often do and encouraged us to do, he would say, when you go to church, where do you go? And the mechanic said to him, oh, yeah, 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 I'm a Christian. I go to church on Christmas and Easter. Jay thought for a moment, and he said, okay, okay, let me just ask you a question. If you only worked on cars twice a year, do you think you could call yourself a mechanic? Ouch. I always thought, like, what was that repair bill like? I am sure it spiked up. But we need to be together, and we need to be with the Lord in our personal time daily. Number third guideline is you have to remain focused. Verse 22 says, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. In any report card you see, there's always a section for your grades, but then next to it, there's that comment section. And some of us in this room may have had comments that said something like this, has trouble focusing, doesn't stay on task, easily distracted. I don't know about you as an adult, but if I got a report card today, I can kind of guarantee those would be probably in my comment section. And it's understandable because we have a world that is screaming at us every single day to say, pursue this, pursue this, pursue this. If you don't believe me, I checked into some research about advertising. And in the 1970s, they projected that the average American would see between 500 to 1,500 advertisements within a day, in magazines, on TV, uh, a billboard, a bumper sticker, whatever it might be, a t-shirt. 30 years later, in the year 2000, they did that survey again, and they found that the average American was probably seeing four to 5,000 advertisements within a day. Today, they project that the average American sees between six and 10,000 advertisements in the day. One, because we're all on our devices. Two, I believe because even when I pump gas, I have advertisements to that little screen, right, when you're watching TV. Now, you could debate the numbers, but you can't debate the trend. From the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep, 
The world is telling you, you are not good enough. You don't look good enough. You're not financially secure enough. You need to pursue this. You need to take this pill, buy this product in order to be what you should be. And God says, in the midst of all that noise, pursue righteousness, love, a pure heart. And I got to tell you, as a pastor, it feels like an uphill battle. This morning, I'm going to say about 3,000 words from here. And some of you think maybe that's 1,000 too many. But that's how many I'm going to probably say up here. 3,000 words knowing that you're going to get about 5,000 messages that say to pursue something totally different. So how do we be sure that we pursue that righteousness? Well, part of what Paul said there is be sure you get around people who aren't perfect, but who are pursuing the same thing. Maybe unplug, get back in nature, take some time just to be still. Learn how to be bored with nothing to do. The fourth thing that he tells us as a guideline is we have to refrain from mischief. It says this in verse 23, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. You know, in every class, and if you're a teacher today, I'm going to tell you something that's not a surprise. Uh, tomorrow, you're going to have a troublesome kid in one of your classes. It's just going to happen. There's always that kid who can't sit still, maybe pulls girl's hair, whatever it might be, just a little bit of a troublesome kid. Well, this scripture says for us in this class, we need to be sure we refrain from mischief. In fact, that verse tells us one thing we have to do is don't have anything to do with stupid arguments. Boy, if I was king for a day, I would make everybody have to print that out and put it on every social media device that they own. To think that through before they post something or say something or get involved with something that just produces quarrels. One way you refrain from mischief again is to be around people that are trying to do the same thing. To recognize that the temptations that you have may not be the same temptations that I have, but I need to actively find safeguards to be sure I don't fall into them. One of the things that helps keep me in check is kind of asking myself this question. Do the people who know you the best respect you the most? Do the people who know you the best respect you the most? See, because you can put on a mask when you go to work, when you go to school, and people think, wow, he is just something. She is just great. He, she's got it all. And you can pretend for a season. But the people in your life who are ringside, who see the good and the bad and the ugly, but do they still see you as a person of character and integrity? Fifth and final guideline is you got to read the book. You got to read the textbook. As I mentioned earlier, it is so important, and here is my challenge. Tomorrow is back to school. Tomorrow is a clean slate. It's a new start. Everybody starts tomorrow with straight A's. How about you when it comes to God's word? Here's my encouragement. Would you take your phone or your, your, your um, watch or whatever tomorrow and set it for two minutes? Two minutes, not a minute more, not a minute less. And just read God's word for two minutes. That's less than the amount of advertisements in a commercial. And do that for a week. And tell me that God doesn't say something to you. Tell me that God doesn't change your attitude in some way or another. Because the reality is many of us read the Bible more in public when we're here together than we ever do in private when we're alone with the Lord. So those are the guidelines. And finally, there's the grade for the class. On a lot of syllabuses, they're, they're at the end, right? The grade. And again, tell it on myself, but there were some classes I took that I wasn't too excited about. And I may have flipped to that grade section real quick, blown by everything else, because I just wanted to see what's the bare minimum. What do I have to do to get a C and just get through this class? You ever do that? Well, some people see the Christian life that way? What do I have to do just to squeak by? What is the bare minimum it takes to just say some magic words, stay out of a bad place, go to a good place, but I don't really want to change and really look like Jesus? And I got to tell you, those are some of the most miserable people I know. 
because they can't enjoy sin fully that they're entertaining because they know God has called them to something better and the Holy Spirit convicts them of it. And yet they're not experiencing the blessings of God fully because they're not over there yet either. They're kind of in this C, bare minimum, average Christian life. And they're unsatisfied. The reality is we do get a grade. But it's not an A, B, C, D, or F. It's a pass-fail. Have you registered, accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior? Are you serving the Lord with all that you are? and who you are. You may remember in school on occasion, if you had a teacher that was filled with grace, you might have had a grade be curved. That's when kind of everybody in the class doesn't do so hot. Maybe one student did, and, and for nothing you did, they're just going to give you 20 extra points, and your C is going to become a B plus or something like that. Well, can I tell you, this class, Eternal Life, it's graded on a curve. You see, we were all failing, all falling short, but when Jesus came and walked and lived a perfect life and died for you and me, his grade was A plus, plus, plus to infinity. And God in his grace said, I'm going to give you his grade if you'll accept him. But we do get a comment. And hopefully in your comment score on your heavenly report card, it'll say what I'm hoping mine will say. Well done, good and faithful servant. Amen? Today we're going to do something a little bit different. We want to be sure we pray and actually commission off every student, every teacher, every bus driver, every custodian, every administrator that will be working or has been working in a school system this year. Whether you're from preschool to, to doctoral work, we want to be sure we pray for you. Lots of times we bring up teams here who are going to go overseas and we commission them. We pray that they're going to be missionaries over to where they go. Well, tomorrow, I see it. We're about to unleash thousands of missionaries right here in Northern Virginia to be hope and to be light to school systems and students and parents and teachers that desperately need it. So if you are a student or a teacher or involved with the schools, at any moment, will you stand up with me? We're going to just pray for you. Come on, I see you kids. Come on, stand up. Just stand up right there if you have any role in that. And I want you to look at each of them. And tomorrow, if you are a person who the new school year doesn't really affect you, be sure you pray in the morning for these people who are going to step into classes and hopefully bring glory to God as they learn as they, and as they grow. Let's pray together. God, right now, I just pray a prayer of commissioning to every man, woman, boy, and girl who is standing right now and throughout this building, who tomorrow will enter into classrooms and school buildings. And I got, pray, God, for them that they will learn and they will grow and they will mature and they will enjoy education, that they will do well and bring glory to you in that. But also, God, I pray that they will remember who they are, whose they are, and that their church loves them, that they would see themselves as a missionary, to maybe give an encouraging word to the, to the student who is new, who doesn't know anybody, to maybe sit with the kid that no one else wants to sit with, to maybe be a helper to a teacher that really needs it. For the adults in the room, God, I pray that you would give them a boldness in their witness in such a way that draws people to you, not overtly in your face, but just in a love and a kindness that people will say, I want what they have, which is that peace of God. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. If everyone else will join them in standing, we're going to go ahead and sing our final hymn. The pastors will be up front if you would want to join this church and be a part of a great place to grow in the Lord. Let's sing together. Oh. Uh -huh. 
Thank you, baby seated. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. Now that the school year is starting for many of you, things are picking up here at First Baptist. The Young Adults Forum is taking place on Saturday, August 27th at 5.30 p.m. in the Faith Activity Center. It's an evening of dinner and discussion around the topic, is karma Christian? No RSVP is required, so put the data on your calendar and come and bring a friend along as well. We're kicking off the new church year on Sunday, August 28th with Promotion Sunday. Everyone from preschool through 12th grade is moving up into new groups. Please pray for all involved, and if you feel led to be part of discipling our children and our youth, we still have openings for group leaders. Please contact Shanika or me if you have any questions. All of our regular Wednesday night activities will resume on August 31st. That means children's choirs, RAs, GAs, adult choir and orchestra rehearsals, and Wednesday night dinner will all be starting up next week. Check the website for more information and to make your reservations for dinner. Also starting next Wednesday is Grief Share, a support ministry for anyone who is dealing with the loss of a loved one. It will take place from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Wednesday evenings throughout the fall. And you can find out more information and register by going to the home page of the church website or clicking on the link in the beacon. Of course, there's much more that will be happening this fall that you'll be hearing about. If you don't get the beacon, be sure to go to the website and subscribe so you won't miss out. If you're heading back to school soon, be sure to pick up a back-to-school blessing card with a fun pencil on your way out. When you use the pencil, remember that God is watching over you and your church loves you. Take care and have a great week. Kimberly, that is so sweet. Thank you. And here's a little card and, uh, at each door. And so if you're going back to school in any form, Get the little card and remember that we care about you and that God is with you through Jesus Christ. You're on a mission, and we're on this mission together. And wherever we go Monday to Friday, you are important, and your presence really does encourage us. And it really does increase the force of the gospel of Jesus Christ as we go out into the week. Glad you're here today. Let's pray together. Father, we do give ourselves to you for your commissioning that we, as we go from this place, are on mission with you by your Son, Jesus Christ, and by your Holy Spirit, that we not audit the class, but we engage fully in the mission you have for us, and that you, as our teacher and leader, will be the total one that we pursue, follow, and proclaim. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ, amen. Go in peace.